I stole Brant's wireless. Um, we're going to start with a hymn that was sung when Anne Honeywell dedicated the organ. So the last repair of the instrument was in the late 80s. Anne Honeywell from Roberts did a recital at that time. And at that recital uh, was sung, Praise the Lord the Almighty. We're going old school. You've got to use that red book in front of you called the hymnal. <laughs> Number 210. <laughs> just going to take two or three minutes to give you the broadest overview of the instrument's history. Um, I actually recently reread Tally Almquist's History of the Church that she wrote um, for the Bicentennial in 2007. Um, if you have a copy of that, uh, you might check it out. Basically, 1907, when the church was 100, that was the reason the organ was bought. If you look at the picture, can you go back two slides, please, David? Um, you can't see it on this, but if you look at the one on the bulletin the last few weeks, you can actually see the 100 under the little finger that precedes the stained glass window. Um, so if you look in last week's bulletin, you can see it actually says 100. So that was why the instrument was bought, was to celebrate the centennial of the church. It was more of a theater organ uh, at that time. That was sort of the style. In the 1960s, um, some work was done that replaced a couple stops, moved some stops around. I won't get into all that this afternoon, but basically they added a mixture. So that stop you heard on the last verse that made the organ louder, that stop was sort of the major addition to the instrument. So that's how I can sort of make sure you're singing on Sunday mornings. <laughs> um, and then several folks with us today were part of the work in the 80s um, that involved re-padding, re-felting, 
everything in this instrument is mechanical except for the air. Okay, so everything is mechanical. I push a key, levers, 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 go through the whole thing, ultimately opening a hole that lets air through a pipe. It's all mechanical. And so men of the church in the 1980s did a lot of that work. Fun fact that I forgot to mention, just a couple of years it was hand pumped. I was going to make a joke out of this, but Uni already yelled at me. It was Uni's father was one of the people who would hand pump this thing in 1907 when it was installed. I said it was impossible because Uni's not that old, but I got in trouble for that. <laughs> <laughs> so it was completely mechanical. The water pump, the water came through the village, and the water, right, the water made the air pump work, and then it was electrified. So otherwise, it's a completely mechanical instrument, and that's part of why it needs this work, you know, now 2021. That's part of the reason. It just needs some maintenance, okay? Um, at this point, I would like to turn it over to Scott Huntington. We're really just really happy that he agreed to come. Um, I interacted with Scott through Rick Parsons uh, from the Parsons Organ Company, and uh, I had a chance to meet Scott a month or two ago and uh, he was gracious enough to come and speak for just a few minutes, so I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Where? They told me I could only talk for 15 minutes, and I could easily talk for an hour. So <laughs> if I go over the 15 minutes, I, I, I think somebody's probably going to ring a bell or something. Uh, so I'm here to, well, first of all, I'll tell you why I came to see this in May is because Rick Parsons had sent me pictures of this organ's action and its wind chest were like something I'd never seen before. And so I called Rick and I said, is it possible to get in to see this thing? I can't believe how this thing works. I want to see it for myself. Well, like that? Okay, well, one of the reasons you can't hear me is because of all this carpet up here, and we're going to talk about that a little later. Uh, so once I saw this, I thought, well, this organ's really interesting, and it's, it's in a pretty decent state of preservation. Uh, I talked to Alden, and he said, yeah, we're, we're contemplating spending some money on this. Um, and I said, well, I'm coming back here in July. I'm happy to come and talk to you and tell you why it's important and why you need to spend this money on this rather unique musical instrument. So I'll start by telling you what it is and why it's important and why you should appreciate the fact that you are so fortunate to have it. It was built by Charles Viner and Son in Buffalo. Uh, Charles Viner Sr. Uh, was born in England. His father, Frederick, moved here with his family just after the Civil War. He moved to Westfield, Massachusetts, and worked with one of the preeminent organ builders of the 19th century, William Johnson. Uh, when Charles came of age, he too went to work for William Johnson and became one of his key employees and installers in the 1890s. The company voluntarily went out of business by the end of the 1890s because they were a rather conservative company then they saw they had no interest in embracing the new inventions uh, largely involving electricity. So they voluntarily went out of business. Charles moved to Buffalo. I have no idea why other than it was a, a really thriving city economically and it was in sort of an organ desert. And so he was able to make a rather lucrative business in Buffalo. The building he was in still stands after he went out of business, son went out of business in 63. Uh, and he, this was an organ factory that he had actually purchased. The organ factory was built in the 1870s. It served as a refrigerator company and a car uh, repair company, but that's all beside the point. Um, this is the third, no, this is the seventh organ that Charles Viner made. And when he established his company in 1998, 1898, he was continuing the tradition of William Johnson, which was organs of extraordinarily high quality, built with good materials and really solid classical type of voicing, he did, which is what, how the pipes sound. He did not get into the trend that was moving towards orchestral 
voicing and instruments where the organ was gradually trying to sound like an orchestra and not like an organ. So Charles Viner's organs could have had the Johnson nameplate on them for like the first 10 years he was building them. His first organ still exists in Alexandria Bay. It was built in 1899. Uh, this is organ number seven and there's one other organ out of all the organs that Charles Viner built between 1899 and 1930, only three are left, and this is one of them. Um, so that's, that's pretty significant. The fact that uh, it has this rather unusual style of action that was unique to Charles Viner, I'm still trying to figure out where he learned how to do this because it's sort of a German concept of organ wind chest building. That's the chest that the pipes stand on. I'm still trying to figure that out, but the fact that this is the only surviving example of that Winchest in his organs is also a matter of significance. Um, I, I heard some of you, who, when you didn't know who I was, talking amongst yourselves about how expensive this process was going to be. And one thing I can tell you is that when you look at that, you aren't seeing but the merest fraction of what is inside, and it's completely handmade. It was 500 years ago, and they're still completely handmade today, which takes a lot of hours, believe me. So that's why organs are really expensive, is because it's, it's not the materials, it's all hand labor. If you had to build this organ today at brand new organ prices, it would cost you over $550,000. So the $80,000 you're considering spending on it to make it last in good condition for another 100 years is but a drop in the bucket. Organs like this building are built to last for centuries. Their life is measured in centuries, not like those speakers or your refrigerator or your computer or a fake organ whose lifespan is measured in decades. It, next to this building, that is probably the most valuable thing you own. And like a building, which is meant to last for a very long time, it needs periodic maintenance. Just like this needs a new roof, it may need to have the walls painted, it may need a new heating system, etc. This needs the same sort of long-term maintenance to keep it going. Everything in here is a renewable resource. As long as they cut down trees, mine metal, and grow cows, this has replacement parts. And there's a lot of things that you hold in your hand and stare at for hours every day that will not last forever and often does not have permanently replaceable parts. So I want to tell you a little bit about what you're looking at. And if you could bring back that slide, please, of the two organs that. First thing, if you look at one thing you'll notice in the old picture on the left is the contrast of light and dark. And you see that throughout the room. This is the aesthetic of almost every century, both architecturally and in organ case design, up until modern times. You'll see there's dark trim around the windows. You'll see that there is stenciling, which is a light and dark contrast. These pews were originally dark wood. The organ was natural wood. That There's beautiful quartered oak under this white paint. And what I just noticed as I was staring at the picture out there today, and you can't see it so well in this picture, but there is walnut trim picking out the inside of every inset, pa inset panel. So this organ was picking up the light and dark architecture of the room by having this walnut contrast to the white oak the golden oak, actually, quartered golden oak. The facade pipes would have been gold. That was the aesthetic of the era. It was also the pre-Civil War aesthetic from the time the first organ arrived in America in 1703 until 1860. Organ pipes were painted, actually, they were gilded. When that became really expensive by 1890, they went to gold paint. Between 1860 and 1890, when the woodwork above the impost, which is the middle belt of the organ, right at the pipe feet, when that woodwork went away because they were trying to cut corners, the organ still needed architectural interest. So that architectural interest was added by stenciling on the facade pipes, which could be quite extensive. 
or bands of color. And that was very definitely a Victorian aesthetic. But by the 1890s, when this organ was being built, that aesthetic was slowly moving away to just plain gold. So what I look at when I see in this room, I don't see as much light and dark contrast anymore, except like the, these little caps on the pews, there's the light and dark contrast there, but there's no light and dark contrast here. And every time I look at that organ, the white pipes just send me into orbit. <laughs> or one of a better word. Um, and I understand the aesthetic of, if I said, you know, it'd be really nice if you want to strip the case and go back to the golden oak, because, I mean, who paints a noble hardwood? But you have all this other white furniture up here, so even if you lo I lost that argument, and you want to leave the case white to match all this other white furniture, at least paint the pipes gold so that you have that light and dark contrast. The organ pipes are meant to reflect what is inside that box. They are not meant to dissolve into the wall visually. Inside this box are wind chest, wind trunks, action, and pipework. And if you are ever curious enough to actually see how it works, ask Alden to open the door and show it to you because you will be amazed what lurks inside this box. And that's why this $80,000 figure, which is going to fix this mountain of stuff in here, is going to be so expensive. If you took everything in that box and spread it out on these pews, the church would be full. And so when you spread all this stuff out and you actually get an idea of how much material is actually in this, you would say, how did they ever get it all in there? Once you look in here and see all the pipework, uh, which a lot of it is from the rebuild in the 60s, that rebuild was nicely done. It was in the aesthetic of the time, which was sort of more Baroque than the rather cigars and grandy sort of grand round tone of the, of the 1907 organ. But there are still several sets of pipes left from 1907 to give you a sense of what that organ sounded like. At this point, we're not talking about dialing back the clock to any periods of tonal time. We're just talking about making the organ work reliably for another 100 years. Because right now, it is not working reliably, and it's a challenge for Alden every morning when he sits down to play. He doesn't know if something's going to work or not. You don't know it's not working because he's playing around it. But he knows that every Sunday he walks in, he can be frustrated by one thing or another. Then there's the carpet. Wall-to-wall <laughs> -wall carpet, which I know is, is comfortable, it's comforting, it makes footfalls very quiet. It is the worst acoustical substance you can possibly imagine. And I don't advocate pulling it all up because the amount that you have in the runners and so, that's part of the aesthetic of the room. But all the carpet that's up here that is sitting in front of these two musical instruments is having a significant impact on their ability to get their sound into the room. As a matter of fact, this poor piano, and I, it, you have to just pound the daylights out of it to get the sound out into the room. I was struck when I heard the organ how much better it filled the room than the piano does. It's higher up in the air, it has the reflective surfaces of two plaster walls to help it get out into the room. But the first thing that happens is the upper harmonics in the organ pipes are being sucked up by the carpet in front of it. The piano is sitting on carpet, and the carpet is absorbing the sound coming out of the piano. So at the very least, very least, pull up as much of the carpet in this area as you can comfortably stand and leave reflective hard surfaces in front of the music making components of the liturgy in this room. You still want to have a runner down the center? Fine. But make it as hard a weave as you can find and don't put a pad under it. Because the room is the most important stop in the organ. If you took this organ and moved it someplace else, it wouldn't sound the same at all. And so you want to give this organ as an effective, a resonant space as possible. And by doing, just getting rid of pieces of carpet in this room will make a dramatic difference in the organ and the piano's effectiveness and people singing up here as well. Um, 
I think that's all I was going to say. So it's probably 15 minutes or more. So the bell's about ready to go off. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer your questions, whether they're technical or about the history of the organ. But it, it's, it's been a real pleasure for me to come here and speak with you about why this is such a treasure. And it's probably more of a treasure than you knew you had. And why this is something for you and the community to appreciate and treasure and be glad you have, because you could probably never buy it again if you lost it. So uh, enjoy this enhancement of your blended liturgy as one piece of a broad music program. And thank you. Thank you, Scott. I wanted to give you just a sort of one to two minute overview of what Scott was just saying. So up here, these pipes, these still sound, OK? So when I pull this principle and I hit this C, that's that big pipe right in the middle, OK? So these guys over here, those are just pretty now. They were live pre-1964. But these pipes up front still do, and you can see you don't usually pay attention. If you look real close, can you see how the two on either side of the middle are actually not exactly the same height? You probably never paid attention, right? It's actually chromatic, right? So it goes boom, 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 right up. So some Sunday morning, come on up here. If you stand right here, you can hear the stereo of the pipes going back and forth. So the instrument has principal ranks, and it's eight foot. Eight foot matches the piano. So if I hit this and Kristen hit the C of the piano, it's the same. <clears throat> and it's acoustic, well, you know, the, the acoustics, so eight foot matches piano, four foot cuts it in half, which acoustically puts it up an octave, two foot puts it up two octaves, okay, and 16 goes down an octave. That's as much as our instrument has. So there's a 16 foot pipe back in there that is this, this little pedal. Like the rumble, right? The rumble of that. So eight foot is the piano, 16 is an octave below, four is an octave above, two is two octaves above. So I can do things like, so here's the eight. I'm going to add a four. I'm going to add the two. And that's how I get the organ louder and softer on a given Sunday morning. Then you've got, so those are principles. That's sort of like the main voice. There's flutes. I already told you about the mixture. The mixture sounds no good by itself. It's designed to be, you heard Scott mention harmonics, it's designed to be played on top of another one. And then over here, there is an oboe stop. This is Kristen's favorite, I'm joking. <coughs> And there's a string, nice and soft. And then there's eights and fours, flutes again. So when we're doing hymns on Sunday morning, I usually do something like this. This is nice and full. If the second verse calls for it, I'll soften up here. And that's how we sort of make it work from Sunday to Sunday. Um, I put a piece together. Yeah, let's go up one slide, please. So Cécile Chaminade uh, was a French composer, a female composer. Um, I couldn't trace down exactly when she wrote this, but she was most active at the turn of the 20th century. So as best as I can figure, this piece was written close enough to 1907 for us this afternoon. Um, so this is a piece by Cécile Chaminade that just lets you hear the sort of melodic of the instrument. I am going to use Kristen's favorite stop, because she can't stop me. Um, <clears throat> but I soften it by adding a flute. It just gives it a little more softer tone. And so I'm going to use that solo sound with an accompaniment from the other stop. So just give me a second. This anyway.
even in the midst of that, you may or may not have heard one of the pedals was not sounding. So that was just a fun, um, like, like Scott said, there's always a surprise. Um, I'm reversing two and three. Um, I'm not going to go total teacher mode on you here today, but I want you to try to connect the dot between what I'm about to play and something else we've already done this afternoon. So this is the German name of the tune, Lob den Herren, and it's arranged by Hobson, who is a modern uh, arranger for organ. Honeywell taught me when I took lessons with her, which is if you do the eight and the two, so if you skip the four, hold on, if you just do the eight and then add the four and add the two, that's this sound. And Honeywell taught me to knock out the four and you get this cool sound that has this sort of open and airy because you don't have the middle voice. So this is a little homage to Ann Honeywell, teacher. to plant somebody who could answer it. So can somebody connect the dots? What was that? It was a praise to the Lord, yes. So the, um, from the beginning of all of this, and this is why I switched these two, because it made more sense to do this before the hymnody, we've always had the Psalter, right? The 150 Psalms. That's been what we've worshipped with always. And over the course of time, think about people like Martin Luther, J.S. Bach, what happened is there was an assumption that everybody knew the tune. And so the artistry came from being able to assume you knew the tune and you could do something like what Hal Hapson just did there. Like some of that sounded kind of cool, some of it was a little out there, but you knew the tune. And that's the origin of the sort of artistic part of organ playing of the last two, three hundred years, is the ability to assume you know that tune so I can do interesting improvisatory things over it. So just to remind you of how that works, Kristen stole this from me two weeks ago because we sang Old Hundred two Sundays ago. And we're going to sing it again because it's a good tune. Um, so it's, um, I have it not written down. It's, it's um, hymn 101. 101. So we're going to sing 101. This is a bad musician joke. I, it should be 100, because this is the 100th psalm. Why it's 101 in our hymnal, I don't know, but I didn't write the hymnal. Will you stand and sing?
And then I just put a, this is a fun little toccata that was written by Paco Bell. Most of you know Paco Bell for this thing. It was even done last week at our wedding. You get the idea, that's, that's the one. Um, this is a different piece by Paco Bell, just uh, it's a nice little toccata. Tom's turn. <laughs> I've learned two things this afternoon already. One is never follow Alden on the program. <laughs> Second is I never knew flooring and carpeting could be so important and um, might have to scrap the whole thing and add some flooring to it. Thank you, Scott. Um, my wife's handing out the sheets now. If you don't have one, I'll just give her a couple minutes to get them to everyone. A few words to begin. Um, Alden brought this to the attention of the session at least a couple, three years ago. Well, we all knew that the, session, the organ had had problems of various sorts. Alden, with his expertise, was able to find the problems and identify with the help of the people from Parsons all that had to be done. And he started talking about the need for doing this probably in 2019 when we had the, uh, the people from Parsons come out and have a, have a look at it. Finally got it to the session during the winter and spring right in the middle of the pandemic. And we had a good, we have a good estimate from Parsons. It's a long list of things that have to be done. First thing to know is that it can't be done piecemeal. All of it's part of the same thing. Uh, any one of the weak links could be a weak link. And it's not going to be fixed until you fix that weak link. So it's a total effort uh, from everything that needs to be work, worked on. Um, the estimate we had from Parsons uh, at the beginning of this year for 2021 estimate was about $85,000. Um, it's not going to be done in, 80, in this year whether we vote on it or, or not because Parsons is, is full up. They wouldn't have the space on their uh, 
schedule any, anyway, so it's going to be done if it is done next year. And that might, I, I think the estimate is about a 1.7% increase, so you take 1.7% on, on, on that and it's maybe $2,000 $2, or something. Um, so that would be the cost for next year if we go ahead and, and, and do it. it. It's laid out in, in two parts. The first part is the fund is the pledge drive, and the second part is the funding. Uh, we did it separately, which is different than we've done most things in the past, because given the fact that um, uh, there's questionable future for the economy in some in some areas, still in the still in the pandemic, and the, the church has put out a very high priority the need to staff a children's minister and staff assistant to the worship leader. Those are two important staff positions we don't have now, so they would be an extra cost. So that's a cost we look forward to being able to spend uh, sometime in the next two or three months. So this comes in on, on, on top of that. So we decided to run a pledge drive, asking people to fill out the pledges and re return them to us, to. Uh, Mike to Mike Wilson, as you do your weekly, monthly, monthly giving, uh, fill out the form at the, form at the bottom uh, from, from now to the end of the year. And we'll look at that, the session will look at that at the end, end of the year, how much of the $85,000 has been pledged. If it's, if it's at 85 or uh, above that, great. If it's a little bit below, below that, uh, the uh, session has the chance to uh, use some extra funding from our already existing investments. And we have almost half a million dollars in invested funds separate from what's in the checkbook to run the operations of the, of the church. So there is money there. Much of it's designated for missions, specific missions. Some of it's designated for summer, for, for summer camps. Um, there are other designations in there, but of all of that money, probably... 200,000 of it is not, not designated today. So that could be used, some, some of that could be used. If it's well below $85,000, that indicates a level of uh, support for the program that's probably not acceptable to the church given everything else we have to do. So if that happens, I don't know what that number could be, but we'll maybe, maybe find that out. We'd have to make the decision to essentially stop the effort, stop the program, not uh, tell, um, we, we haven't signed anything with the, the Parsons people yet. And if we wanted to, we'd be doing it hopefully in January. If it came out low, considerably lower than the 85,000, we'd have to tell them no. If it, if it comes out there so we can go ahead, go ahead, that begins the funding part of the program, asking all of you folks who have made, who have made pledges to uh, act on, on that. And, um, and try to give that uh, pledge money, or at least a, a, a part of it, by uh, June of next year, and we're extended all the way to June of 2023. So that gives us about a year and about a year and a half, two years almost, uh, to raise the funds to get to get the money in. Um, if we have, if we go ahead, and we uh, get maybe say 25,000 by June of next year, knowing we'd look for the other 50,000 later on, we can still go ahead because we can borrow from our own investments. So that shouldn't slow it up once we make the decision to go. Um, so that's what I'm asking if you would, uh, all of you, if you know other folks in, in the church, we've got some more f forms laid out on the uh, table in the hall hallway. Um, fill out the pledge, fold it up, put it in an envelope, send it back to Mike Wilson, either in the white boxes out front or on the side, or stick it in the mail, and we'll, um, and we'll take it from there. Mike will let us know how, how it goes week to week, and, and, and we'll see. So that's the, the message. I, I think that uh, I certainly appreciated the words from Scott about the history of this instrument and what has gone into it and what it means. I would have never thought of modern day version of this would cost $500,000. My heavens, that's, that's an investment and that's an investment we have in hand that needs a 
what he what he called the pittance, but it's a sizable pittance to fix up. Any questions I can take from you folks now? I'll, otherwise, I'll, I'll, I will uh, turn it back to Alden. Bruce. Unfortunately, no, and largely because a lot of grant organizations do not want to give money for sacred purposes because they, they want to maintain a separation of church and state kind of aesthetic. But there are places that occasionally can find county preservation grants. Uh, I don't, is this Genesee County? Yes. I, I don't know if Genesee County has grants like that or not, but. Um, there's a woman that if anybody knows about them, it's her. Her name is Cynthia Hauk, and I can send you that name, uh, who, has, who's, who loves the organ. And she's turned over countless rocks in, in Genesee County uh, to basically just because she, she's become an organ buff, uh, she's done, do, been doing a lot of research about the historical organs of Genesee County. And I know that she goes digging to find whatever fundraising money she can find at the grant level. I don't, I'm not really confident that Genesee County has these kinds of grants. Um, so it's, it's tough finding that kind of grant money. But if anyone can help you, it would be her. And I'm happy to send someone name. I can just tag to what Scott said that one of the challenges is that work from the 1960s so the organ isn't original in that regards because I had started a couple chats with a couple folks in Monroe County thinking well they don't need to know we're one mile over the county line um, but just to get that context and that's the other problem is it's not original original in terms of catching that's somebody's excitement. True. If, if this organ was exactly as Charles Viner had left it, and what few grant money might become available for historic objects like that, it, it would probably be disqualified, frankly, uh, f as an historic object based on the changes that were made in the 60s for the kinds of organizations that give grants for historic preservation. But that doesn't mean there's none out there. It's just going to be tougher to find them. Are there any technical questions that anybody has about what needs to happen and why? OK. Uh, one of the things that happened in the 60s was the organ's original bellows, which is the organ's lungs, was removed and replaced with two small modern bellows, probably because it was cheaper to do so. And when I say big, the original bellows, because the organ was hand pumped and needed a voracious capacity of air in reserve, it, it filled practically the entire base of the organ. Having a reservoir and a cubic reserve of air that large has a, has a a noticeable impact on the way the pipes respond to their wind. Because even though this is a machine, it is a living and breathing object from the musician's point of view. And especially the year it was built, it required two people to play it. You had to have someone applying a lot of physical energy at the pumping handle. And you had the organist. And he couldn't practice unless there was somebody to go pump the organ for him. Being able to flip a switch and turn on a blower or turn a valve to turn on a water motor was like the invention of the electric light for an organist. And once the water motor came around, the reason it was so attractive to churches is that they typically got their water free. And a water motor in the course of a church service could go through 200 gallons of water or more. And if you were paying for that, it would be really expensive because it just comes through, it works as piston, and then it just spilled out on the ground. So uh, it, it, was, it would have been a significant expense of water if you would had to pay for it. So now that that wind system is gone, uh, the, the wind system that, he, that it has now, which are these two smaller bellows, is a little bit jittery in its response to the wind. 
th there isn't this sort of long breathing thing that happens when the organist is playing, not necessarily audible to you, but it is to him and in the overall effect of the organ. And with these smaller bellows, that because of their size, they respond quicker because they're smaller and the volume of air that, it, that is moving every time you play is smaller. So every time the top of the bellows moves in response to the wind that's being taken out of it, there's going to be this quick little jitter that goes into the wind system. And it, it, you'd have to listen very close to hear it, but it's part of this broad sound effect that your mind as a processor processes in a certain way, even though you're not conscious of hearing it. And by replacing that wind system with a replica of the original wind system, this really important aspect of the organ sound is going to come back. And I'm really happy that, that you are deciding to go with this upgrade on top of the original mechanical restoration, which is just fixing all the things that are unreliable from week to week for Alden. And things, you know, wood and leather has a lifespan. It doesn't last forever. But its lifespan is very long, and it's measured in decades. And th this is reaching a point where some of that stuff has now gotten fragile. The leather's deteriorating. You know, leather lasts 25 to 50 years. Um, so this stuff just needs to be renewed. Uh, and, and it's very dirty. And the dirt is also affecting the way it sounds. And so basically, it's, it's just getting a rehab. You know, you're coming in, you're replacing the roof, you're putting a little fresh paint on the walls, you're vacuuming the daylights out of it, you're washing all the windows, you're upgrading the electrical system. That's what's going to happen. Euphemistically, of course. Yes? It doesn't affect the sound at all. Um, you idea, unless the paint is really secure, in which case you can encapsulate it under a primer and then put gold over it, this paint is not secure. Especially if you look at the side and these side pipes in that flat right over Alden's head, there's a lot of crazing going on, and which means the paint is separating from the gold surface under it. And if you put paint on top of that, it would become even more visible. So because this paint is not adhering very well to the surface underneath it, I would really recommend that, that they be stripped. Um, or at least talk to a decorator and figure out, well, is there a way we can encapsulate this under something instead of stripping it? Uh, but either way, you want to have a very secure flat surface because the paint will show every imperfection underneath it. So you want to have a really well-prepared surface. Yes? Yes. Yes. All handmade. No. <laughs> no, the blower that you bought a really long time ago uh, is still good. And those blowers, unlike modern blowers, which have built in motors that when the motor goes, you have to replace the whole thing, the old blower, like what you have in the cellar, is also renewable. And it will probably last, a, well, I know it's going to last 100 years because I take care of organs with electric motors like that that are 100 years old. So that, the longevity of that can be measured with the longevity of this. But yeah, there, there will not be any hand pumping capacity. That would be even more money. I mean, you could do it, but it would be more money that you'd probably do better spending on something else, frankly. Yes? That, those pipes are zinc, and uh, what is, there's probably nothing on top of the zinc between that and the gold paint. And what I think I'm seeing when I look at that gold paint, it wasn't just like radiator paint. It had gold powder in it. And this was nowhere near as expensive as using actual gold leaf, which by the 1890s was super expensive. But we can buy paints today just like they did then that has gold powder in it that is more reflective than regular gold paint. Gold paint will tarnish and darken over time. 
but the best paints with gold powder in them do not because gold doesn't tarnish the way silver does. And so if a high quality gold paint with gold powders in it was put on top of these, it would stay shiny for a very long period of time. I'm just going to interject because we're at our 45 minute mark and I, we can certainly take more questions afterwards if there's not like a burning last question right now just because we want to keep the time in mind too. More questions, Scott and I, and we'll all be sure to be around. Well, there is one thing. They don't know who I am. And so I, I'm going to tell you who I am because I'm not just some bozo that just showed up here and thought you have a lovely organ. Um, I've been an organ builder for 40 years. My company specifically specializes in the restoration of antique organs, but before 1700 and the First World War been actively involved with the Oregon Historical Society for 40 years. For 20 years, I was a member of its Historic Organs Recognition Committee, and they've just asked me to take it over as chair after not having been on it for 20 years. I was on its board of directors for 16 years, the last four of which I was its president. And I was one of the authors of its most recent guidelines for conservation and restoration of American pipe organs. The Oregon Historical Society by itself was created in the 1950s to stem the destruction of American organs because people really didn't know what they were throwing away. And the aim and the mission of the organization is to, to raise an awareness of American antique pipe organs and to preserve and document the American pipe organ culture as a part of Americans' cultural history. And that's why we have recognition programs and conventions and a journal, and we have members uh, around the world. It's not a huge organization. It's maybe 3,500 strong, but they, they are passionate about organs like this and just real pipe organs in general. And I'm equally passionate about it and spend a lot of my free time doing research, figuring out what organs are lost and where they were and who built them. And that's sort of how I came upon this and all of a sudden got jazzed about Charles Viner and the odd, oddball action that it has and how well it was built. Okay. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> um, just before you change the slide, just again so everybody knows, uh, Fred, Tom, Rob, and myself are the team that Session has charged with doing this, so uh, feel free to reach out to the four of us with questions. Um, and then on the next slide, as you heard Tom mention, we're, we have a real outreach focus right now on session, especially with the pandemic and now that we've exited the pandemic, looking ahead. And so we're trying to picture this as part of a larger whole. So we could do more things like him sings. Um, I have a decent connection because I work at the place. I spoke with the chair of the organ department at Eastman. He'd be glad to send a doc student out to play recitals for us um, on the instrument should it be restored. Um, other music, I have a memory of Dolores and Gordon telling me that the Ying Quartet came out here every once in a while. Um, other outreach, like classical, it doesn't have to be classical. We've talked on session about like a coffee house kind of a setup. Contemporary Christian music, what would that look like? Saturday nights in the fellowship hall, Sunday mornings here. We're, the point is we're trying to position this as part of a larger outreach of both the music specific of our church and our church in general. So that's the point of this slide is to let you know that we're trying to position this in such a way that it's part of the growth and the outreach to our community um, is part of this work. I'm going to ask you to go ahead two slides so that I can, I'm just going to say one more thing and then we'll sing a hymn and again, any more questions will be around. I just thought you should know this. J.S. Bach, every one of his pieces, he wrote SDG at the end. And it's one of these five tenets of the Reformed faith. God, glory to God alone. And so um, I picked, um, getting myself all, see I flipped the slide and now I'm out of order here. We picked To God Be the Glory as the last hymn because it was performed at the church's 175th anniversary uh, event in 1982. It was also sung at our wedding, so that just it had a little something to do with it. But um, the, as I was putting this all together, 
and I read the chorus of To God Be the Glory, this is what came to my mind is the fact that Bach himself, like, I mean, J.S. Bach wrote SDG on all of his music because it was for God's glory that he wrote all of that music that we play all these centuries later. And so similarly, um, it's our hope that this and all of our work it praises the Lord. It's his glory that we do all of this. So I'm going to let that be our sort of benedictory comment. We're going to sing To God Be the Glory. I appreciate everybody staying after church today, and you can come up for any more questions after that. To God Be the Glory is number 56 in your hymnal. 56. Will you stand and sing? <laughs> <laughs>